This is an internet radio show from InRetrospectPodcast.com. This is the In Retrospect Twelfth Night Special. Welcome, dear listener. Happy 2014. As this is the first show of a shiny new year, I think it's first important to do a roll call, just in case you're a new listener. To my right is a professional games critic, editor, community manager, and co-founder of the company, Peter Willington. Hi. Next to him is a radio studio manager, freelance games critic, and a consummate sound guy, Sam Turner. Hello! Rubbing shoulders with him, his video editor and host of Freeplay, our monthly show devoted to free games, Daniel Frost. Hello. And finally, you've got me, Chris Darby, host of Digital Wonderlust, a show which explores psychogeography and gaming. And a doctor. Don't be, don't be modest. Don't be bashful. Chris, don't, be, don't, don't put yourself down. This is a new year, a new start. We should, we should clarify, he's not a medical doctor, so don't, no. don't send any kind of no. Uh, no. ailments or anything, because we can't help with that. No. No. But nobody can really help with what you got. I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm so much better than that. I'm a doctor of philosophy. I, w- I wish you. I, I wish you were a medical doctor because I still. You know, on the Christmas show, I was a little bit coughy, a little <laughs> bit sneezy. I'm all. I'm, I was many dwarves rolled into one. Um, still, am a little bit. Um, did, did you know that one of the dwarves that originally was going to be used in the Disney film that the name was dropped was Dirty? I was going to say was it Eighty? He's a little Eighty, <laughs> Blackie. <laughs> if already, you're a new listener, already <laughs> yeah. I love the way storming starts. Okay, you join us, listener, for a special annual event, the Twelfth Night Special, in which we all come together once again to present our thoughts on the games we bought each other for Christmas. If you missed our festive edition of the show, then don't worry. Just head over to retrospectpodcast.com and give it a listen. As the free time, yes, free time winner of the Free Play Christmas Quiz, I've become a bit of a veteran of hosting. So the format will be no different this year. Each of us will reflect on our experiences of the game during the Christmas period, ending with a provocation for the rest of the team to discuss. With presents ranging from truthful lies to Elder Scrolls Oblivion, this is sure not to disappoint. Before all of that, though, I think it's time we found out who has been sticking to their New Year's resolutions of last year. Has Pete learned to cook better? <laughs> Pete, have you moved on since buying an onion, a masher and some Tupperware? <laughs> <laughs> have I moved on? Uh, I've moved on in terms of uh, I can do all sorts of different bits and pieces now. Uh, I did tone the hole this year. I did tone the hole. Is this all from I, your National Trust cookery book? It is, yeah. From my That's spaghetti Trust. bolognese, isn't it? It's uh, it's got it on the cover now because I've also learned how to do spaghetti bolognese. Um, I've done all sorts of delicious from, pasta from dishes. From fresh actually. or from jar? From fresh. Oh, you with, make spaghetti uh, yourself? With, well, obviously no. That that's the one thing that I don't do. But I take uh, I take passata and and oh. garlic and onions and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and I've also be I've learned how to. Um, do the Savoy method for poaching an egg, which is poaching an egg without uh, any container or anything like that. So you know, uh, my yeah, my, I would say my cooking is coming on leaps and bounds. And actually, I've been I've been I've taken a real interest in it. I used to not be very interested in the cooking process and how how you get you know raw ingredients from from you know that that sort of uncooked state to something edible and actually tasty. Um, so yeah, that's definitely that's a big big tick. Two okay. years ago, yeah. your New Year's resolution was to make sorbet. Mm. Have you done that yet? Mm. Um, <laughs> have you frozen lemon water? I am yet to do you, sorbet. You're running, <laughs> you're running before you walked. This is the brilliant. Grail. 
This is this is fa- fantastic. You're you're doing things now more complicated than freezing water. Mm. Mm, but I still haven't done frozen. Um, I also uh, just just uh, while we're talking about um, fruit infused waters, um, I uh, I made my own cordials. Oh yeah, yeah, you told us about that, didn't you? Oh so yeah, that's I, this is interesting. Well, I well I I I, um, you, I, I took a, a whole bunch of oranges and lemons and limes and all that sort of thing, and then and then made my own delicious uh, cordials. Some people might call them squashes. So how do um, you do that? You, well, it's very complicated. It takes about forty-five minutes, but like, and it's not really worth the time or the effort. But it's not like, like making beer, though, Pete, is it? It's it's pretty tough. I mean, it's not as it's not making beer, but like, it is it is it is pretty hard going. And um, I, I yeah, I've been experimenting with all that good stuff. And um, well, what's the yeah. process of making cordial? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you say yeah. it's hard work. It's only forty-five minutes. That doesn't sound like a lot of hard work. What, what's like the alcohol. process? You've got to zest and juice a whole bunch of oranges and lemons, like way more than you would think, uh, than you would u- usually use. Um, you need to make sugar, well, syrup, so sugar water. You need to boil up. Um, you so, you're good the, at, so you're good at boiling sugary things. You got yeah, that down. Doing oh, okay, that. I, yeah. I can, see, I've like like you were saying, I've gone the opposite side of the spectrum. He's focusing on the heat-based spectrum of cooking. It's all, it's, all, it's all good. So in my new flat, the point is, in my new, in my new apartment, um, the kitchen's much larger, so I should be able to be, uh, do some more exciting, more extravagant bits and pieces because m- my old kitchen's a bit, uh, bit small, really. Wow. Exciting, exciting. And you thought I was going to be like, nah, mate, I'm still cooking burgers. <laughs> well, you, you haven't made sorbet, so that's, that's another year. Yeah, <laughs> I, did, I did buy I'll you a sorbet you book for your birthday, yeah. so you've you got absolutely, absolutely no excuse. You did, and it is, it is sat there. I am looking at it right now. It is, it is, it is sat underneath my uh, National Trust Complete Traditional Recipe book, and uh, it is going to be cracked out this coming summer. So. Okay, so let's, let's move on to Sam then. Sam, did Hello. you read a book? Did you read a book like you said you would? <laughs> Did I, did I read a book? Was that really my? Um, was that really said, my? Uh... Just, yeah, it, it it didn't seem fully formed in your head as you said it, but no. your plan was to read a book. And I, you said I if it's done by January, that would be it. I definitely have read a book this um, year. What was, what was your what's your your favourite book of the year? Then, would you say? Um, I read uh, a fantastic book by the author, the Kite Runner. Um, ah, yes, yes, Khaled yes. Hosseini, uh, a thousand yeah. splendid sons. Ah, which is very very good. Yes, um, no, a lot of people have read that. Yes, they have. Um, so yeah, so I read I read that. Uh, there we go. I read Wonderful. that book. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, go. and Dan, have you gotten fitter this year? <laughs> actually, I couldn't actually remember what mine was. And well, you didn't so... really you didn't really give one. So no, I, no. I kind of, I've just kind of kept like Pete with the sorbet. I've kind of just extended your one from last year. Well, in that case, then yes, I have, as I've joined a gym. Again, uh, yeah, yeah that doesn't mean you're getting fitter. Well, it? It, it does if I'm if I'm eating better and I'm going to the gym on a regular basis. Yeah, that three or makes four it. times a week. That's, yes, no, that, it doesn't mean you're getting fitter. No, that that would imply that I'm getting fitter. No, 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 no. Going to going to the gym and doing that it, it doesn't necessarily make you fitter. You can still okay, say so you can you can say you can say by. So, for example, like, I could run happily for, like, ten minutes a day. Then I could go to the gym and carry on running for ten minutes a day. I'm not getting fitter. I'm staying at the same fitness level. So just because you go to a gym and eat well and eat healthy is actually no indication of actually you getting fitter. Also, if you go to the gym and you run on a treadmill but you eat a pie at the same time... Yes, yes. No, that that was that was something I learned quite early on. So where are the stats? Where are the stats, Dan? I want... I could run, like, for example, for example, Dan, this year, I've gone from running five kilometres in 40 minutes to running five kilometres in 28 minutes. Right. That, those are my stats. Those sure, are my okay. stats. I know it's a bit of a shaft, but, but hey, I've done it. I've got fitter. True. Right. Stats, Dan. Well, my stats, well, my stats. Well, when I started, yeah. I could run about 10 minutes nonstop on the treadmill. <laughs> Um, now, is that actual um, running or running a bath? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actual a hot running. Bath, a hot actual bath. Your mum's so slow, she couldn't bath. even run a nose. <laughs> but I can do, I do that, and now I can now do 
double that. I can do 20 minutes running non-stop now. Um, my next uh, stage on that is to go into interval training. So uh, that will improve my fitness further from the style of training that I'm doing. Um, I When I first Sorry. started, I could only do... What's interval training? It's in the middle of theatre, when you're in the theatre. It's, uh, the it's, uh, it's it, basically, Pete, it's, uh, it's fitness, it's exercise for quitters. It's like, do a lot, then just take a rest for a little bit, then do another little bit, then take yeah. a rest, then do another yeah, little bit. Say, that but but like it's, given a, of... it's been given a fancy name, so, um, I think so you've... people feel good when they do it. Dan, did you choose that because it has the word interval in it? <laughs> interval... <laughs> <laughs> interval training is where you steadily, over the course of your workout, in, mm. uh, increase your the difficulty. So if you run at a certain speed um, for five minutes, you then sprint for a minute and then walk for a minute, and then you start running again, but at a higher speed. You then sprint at a higher speed. You then walk at a higher speed. And then you go back to start again. And again, you keep on increasing in intervals. Right. So that is that what that is. Right. Um, I've improved the weight that I can lift and the, the amount that I could do. Um, yeah. I've improved the amount of running, um, amount of rowing that I can do. Um, so there, there's your that's stats. What I wanted. That's all I wanted. I just want stats. So, so having a paddle, waiting, resting, and intervals. That's what you're. Well, uh... Dan, Dan, Dan I, am, I am actually is... impressed. I'm impressed, Dan, because last two years ago, no, it was a year ago. Sorry, you talked about you, you took up cricket. You took a ball to the bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgotten about that. I've totally forgotten about that. I've done this cricket. Oh my god, I went to his house and he had all the pads. I know, I saw He had it. everything. Oh my god, I've got the stuff. And you've got the badminton stuff as well. Oh, so many. I love, I love the fact that down in your house, you've got a closet of misadventure. Just stuff, <laughs> stuff that you started. Like you open it all out and you go, oh my god, the badminton, the cricket, the balls. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in your house, Dan. That you you can pick up and refer to as Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> oh dear! Screw you guys! I'm getting fit. Twenty fourteen, and we're still being mean. It's terrible, isn't it? It's it's lovely. It's a lovely. Should we do uh, Should we do resolutions at the end of the show? Should we keep people yeah, I guessing? Think so. I think I think we should. Yeah, I I've think... got a cracking uh, to really tease. I've got a cracker this year. I think oh. I've got a pretty good one actually. Oh, I don't think I've got a very good one. Mm. Fantastic. How's, how's, um, it's at this point that we, we all recall, both Pete, uh, Dan and myself, and none of us can remember what Chris attested to. Well, um, actually, I didn't really attest to anything because my New Year's resolution was to get a PhD. Yeah, that was uh, really... Yeah, <laughs> that was it. I was going to say that. That was it. And I, ha- I, and I did get one. So um, there we go. So I think, yeah. So, so, well so I tick that box. It's not quite as tricky as freezing lemon juice. But, or reading uh, a book, a d- yeah, or reading a book, or yeah, dare I say, getting fitter. But yeah, I did it. So very chuffed with myself actually for that. You should, as well, you should be. Yeah, and and uh, thank you to you guys for doing it. Um, you all got a mention. You're in the opening pages of my thesis, thanks to and a list of names, and you guys are all there. Really? Yeah, of course you are. I've, I've seen that. It's pretty that's cool. Actually, yeah, that's published, Pete. You're actually in the library, Exeter Am University. I really? You're a yes, published you are. contributor. Pete, yeah, Pete, Sam, Dan, yeah, on my CV. I, I need to see this. I need to yeah, see this. I can this. show you. I can send you, a, send you a copy of it. And I've had many people request it. And uh, so that's, yeah. Purely because so, yeah. Pete's involvement. Because one, one of the reasons I took, started doing this podcast was really to kind of, as a kind of a vehicle to help me formulate ideas for my actual thesis. And it's just grown into something quite lovely, actually. So, you know, and I've been doing it for nearly three years now. So, mm. yeah, so I couldn't have really done it, really, without, uh, in retrospect. From resolutions to gifts. Time to see what we've made of our Christmas presents and what discussion topics they suggest. Pete, this is what you got for Christmas. Okay, well, there's golden tinsel inside. Uh, and it's wrapped, uh, which uh, has immediately reminded me of how much a terrible person I am uh, <laughs> for not wrapping mine. Uh, um, I've just dunked all of the gold stuff on the floor. I'll have to pick that up later. Ho, 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 says the packaging. 
on the outside, and it's Get some of that in you. Get some of that audio. Oh, it's an Xbox 360. Oh, it's more tense than the <laughs> Good stuff. That'll clog the Hoover. Um, <laughs> it's a, an Xbox 360 game. Oh, for <laughs> fuck's sake. What is it? What is it? Uh, excellent. Okay, so it is uh, Truth or Lies. Someone will get caught. Someone will get caught. <laughs> Someone will get caught. So, Someone uh, will get caught. Truth or Lies has many, many problems. This is most likely why, at the time of recording, it commands an absurdly low Metacritic score of 28 out of 100. First is the ever-so-intense and always-present presenter, with all his overly brash swagger and daytime TV faux enthusiasm. Would you run naked down a crowded street for $10,000? Yes, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> nice! I'm becoming a fart! Second is the script, full of awkward and occasionally nonsensical jokes, ill-paced for a quick game with friends gathered around the television, but perfectly suited to amping up the uneasy and unenjoyable tension wrought by a game centred on telling uncomfortable truths. Are you still in love with Brett? What? No, I'm not in love with Brett! You guys are crazy! That is such BS! Third, a premise for a game that could, pretty much, be played in its entirety without needing to get a home console involved. Questions are asked, and you have to answer them in as convincing a manner as possible. <laughs> Between a vampire and a werewolf, I'd definitely rather be a werewolf. In bed. <laughs> you told the truth! Fourth, the we're really sorry, please accept these trinkets approach to achievements, dirtying the gaming transaction further with this thinly veiled attempt to placate buyers concerned with chivos and interrupting the play experience for everyone else involved in a party setting. I would kiss Pizza Guy on the lips for $20. I don't have any money. Do you have any money? I could make out with somebody else. The largest problem, though, the root of why truth or lies is such a massive failure is this. Its core conceit, that it can distinguish between a person telling the truth and a person telling a lie all through voice recognition, is thoroughly and absolutely bogus. The chance of being caught out by truth or lies is an even 50-50 split, because whether the unique vocal calibration software can detect you've been telling porkies or not seems to be no more accurate than a coin toss. There may be 3,000 thought-provoking questions, but if the game asking them can't tell whether the answers being fired back are fact or fiction, then the entire point of the game, and indeed the argument for it existing at all, completely falls apart. Someone will get caught, needles the front cover of Truth or Lies. Quite right. But whether it's the right someone, it would seem, is entirely down to chance. <laughs> oh yeah, that's not awkward. Okay, so how much does box art or a PR blurb colour your opinion of a game when bought at retail? Well, maybe the person we should be asking is Pete's Secret Santa. Because <gasps> really, that that's person should give us an insight into what it was about the game that, um, you know, uh, made them buy it. Because obviously they probably wouldn't have played it, so it would have just been the PR and the blurb. And the price. And the but price. Yeah, who, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yes, we probably should. So, Sam. Yes. <laughs> Why did you purchase Truth or Lies? For because I imagined... Your- Person, because I, I imagined a situation where Pete would be on the couch and he'd be playing this game with his good lady, and th- a question would come up like, <laughs> "Have you ever farted in public?" And Pete would go, "No," and he'd go, "Lie," and he'd go, "Oh, Peter, tell me this funny story." And I imagined a situation like that. Basically, uh, I wanted to uh, make Pete embarrassed in front of people who he cares about. Um, what they think about him, mm. um, and that was a reason why why I bought this game. And that is actually what that game offers. Like, yeah. Yeah. So what? So, so what are the what are the kind of questions that you are asking? Because it doesn't because so, it because it kind of says on the box art like 
Um, is it like who's your crush? Or yeah, so so the game asks you right at the start, like very sensibly. This is one of the things I actually quite liked about it. Well, uh, and it was who is in the room, who is playing in the room. So it says, is it children? Is it adults? Is it couples? Or is it a mix? Mm. And therefore, it can skew the answer, uh, the questions that it gives you to to kind of be appropriate. So, for example, with adults, there's a little bit of this, like, who have you got a crush on? And, you know, um, who in the room is sexiest and all that sort of stuff. Oh, and, dear Lord. Um, and what? <laughs> <laughs> I just love the fact that that's your, that's your just idea of hell, isn't it? Chris. And uh, anything awkward <laughs> or cringy, I can't do. No, um, so it's uh, you know, so so that's so that's that's a that's a good thing. It does ask those sort of things, but it also asks things like um, uh, who in the room is most likely to talk your ear off about Tolstoy? And it's like, right, <laughs> shame I wasn't in the room. What? Like we're playing Truth or Lies. Who do you think is playing this? Like, I don't know. Like. It just kind of, it felt like, it felt really awkward. Like, and there's a button that you can press that says, I don't want to answer this question, which is fine. And like that, but none of the questions are particularly, like, I wouldn't have a problem answering any of the questions, not particularly. So some questions, like, I'm looking at the box art now. Like, have mm. you ever fancied someone you shouldn't? Mm. What secret have you never told your best mate? Now, you're never going to, you're never going to go... In a public forum, and say, if you haven't told your best mate, a game's you, not going to pull it out of you. That you once had crabs, yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to tell us something? <laughs> what? Right. what? But it, um, it's a safe but, space, Sam. But it's Is not it? trying. The game's not trying to be nice. It's deliberately trying to put you in that awkward situation. Which is what. Which is what. The, which is what effect. the PR. What the. That's, that's what the PR on the blurb. You know, kind of feeds off is the fact that, you know, it's selling this idea that you've got well on the bo- on the back of the box it says the unique voice calibration software <laughs> um, and it's and i think that you know where whereas pete you were saying like this is a game that you could play with cards the thing is is that i think it plays off people's naivety about the complexity of consoles that they think they have something underneath their tv which is a lot more complex than essentially it appears mm. and I think a game like this is sold on the, on that basis of people thinking that yeah. what they have beneath their TV is essentially more complicated and um, magic, for want of a better word, than it's actually... Uh, Absolutely. So, um, so it, did, did they take, just on, a, just on like on an audio point of view, did they take any like control levels of your voice? Yes. So like yes. saying, is your name Peter... You know, like they do when they take a... Um, what's it yeah. called, Chris? Uh, stenograph? No, it's not a stenograph, is it? It's a... Um, like a baseline. No, the actual... Yeah, what a lie detector is called. Yeah, the lie detectors are actually... You can actually beat. Um, polygraph. There you go. Yeah, the polygraph test, yeah, that you can't actually... It's you can actually beat them. It's a polygraph. Yeah, but what's a stenograph? Oh, a stenograph is... Um, it is, a stenograph is used in courts, but it is a very fast typewriter. Yes, it is. Just, just, uh, what, just one thing uh, for listeners yeah. that Pete's actually done a video of his playing of this game. Um, so this also you'll be able to get an idea of how he pl- how the game plays and his time with it, and that can be found on our YouTube page, uh, youtube.com forward slash in retrospect podcast. That's on there now, so you can check that out. Fantastic. Um, it's it's like Sam. What, what you're talking about here is 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 exactly what I kind of touched on, right? Like, machines, with machines, we think we think science, we think scientific, we think um, there isn't the ability for it to, for, for it to have any sort of emotional impact uh, in terms of, like, it, you know, it's not, it's not going to try and go out of its way to lie to you. Machines don't do that because they're soulless, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so you do, you start buying into this idea that, that, oh, well, of course this thing can tell whether or not I'm lying, like, simply through through voice, you know, voice recognition. You know, of, co- of course it can, because it's it's a computer. Like, and, it, and it's... And part of my problem, part of my larger problem with the game is that it is basically a 50-50 coin, sw- like coin, coin flip. Like, yeah, of course it is. It's, it's, it's saying, 
like I was, I said loads and loads of truths, and fifty fifty, it was like it it would go truth, and fifty fifty, it would go like you know false, and it's bad because if if the other people in the room, and this is a like let's let's be honest, this is a casual game, right? Like the casual audience, I would argue, probably doesn't really know how good technology is and what technology can and can't do. So if so if you're sat there in the room and something says, you know, I don't know, to go to go to a really extreme example, I don't I'm I don't know whether or not it is present this question is present in the game, but you know, if if the thing was to say, you know, have you ever cheated on your partner or whatever, and you were to go, Well no of course not and it went, Liar like the That's Jeremy Carl, isn't it? The people yeah, like but like the people in the room who aren't tech savvy and don't know what the limitations are could very easily turn around and go, Oh, like well that's that's interesting. Why you know, that that that's that that's the case. But yeah, it's it's very it's problematic in some ways and, and, and I, I don't think a lot of people would be very up for buying a game that A doesn't work and B is very much about making people feel uncomfortable. But I think I think in some respects it doesn't have to be clever because it's clever in the sense that it doesn't have to actually work as a lie detector because it, it does its job by introducing an element of doubt. Even what you say, whether it's true or true you, or not, you, it, the people around you, regardless of whether they believe it or not, you've made them. It's made them question you, even even for like you, a nano. You say that you say that, but actually, the, there is a scoring system at the end uh, in the game. And the person who is most truthful wins. Yeah, but I, I would, I, I've put it to you, and I think this might be an interesting experiment for you. If you record yourself, your voice saying, saying yes, you know, when you're trying, when you're telling the truth, and if you just play that each time, I reckon it, it will, it'll still register as a lie in some cases, because it, I imagine, I reckon there's an algorithm in there that just throws a random truthful lie into the mix, I just don't to keep think it interesting. It's... I think what it is is it is taking that sound information in and then it is dumping it out the back and yeah. going flipping a coin and going ah, exactly I yeah I guess like but the thing is the thing is that like like I say like there is you are awarded points for be, for be getting away with either telling lie like either telling lies or being completely honest and open <sighs> right so you're scored at the end for being for being truthful so if you if if it can't tell, then there's no actual way of winning a game. That's like, you know it's it breaks its own rules of of play. It's like to make it to do a football metaphor, and I understand that we're going to dangerous territory with me talking about football metaphors, but but it you know it's like it 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 essentially puts down one set of rules and then kind of changes it on the fly whenever it really fancies it because it can't really tell whether or not you're 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 telling the truth so it's like kicking the ball in the back of the net and sometimes that'll be a goal and sometimes that'll be a foul and what dictates that who knows like literally who knows i mean i mean we could just put it to the test now couldn't we like us as humans me chris and dan (coughs) pardon me we Mm. could use our extensive audio knowledge to see if we could um see if peter's lying or not and see how easy it is. Because if we can't tell, if we can't give a good judgment, then how on earth is a is a computer and a microphone mm. going to be able to tell and differentiate from lie? <laughs> Sorry, lie or truth. Um, so let 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 us all three of us. We'll each ask Peter a question. I will ask the control question, and then Chris and Dan, you can ask Peter questions, and we'll see if we'll see if we can tell if Peter is lying or not. So here we go. Um, <coughs> um, Peter Willington. Mm. It's got, is, it, is it yes or no questions that Truth or Lies asks? Or? No, it just op- asks open questions. Open questions. So, mm-hmm. tell me, Peter Willington. Yes. What you think about the forthcoming union between Dan and his fiance? I think that, and you want the truth as the as a yeah as a control, please. Yeah. Okay, okay, as control. I think it is absolutely the best thing. Uh, Dan uh, and Holly could ever do. Um, they are absolutely perfect, well suited for one another, <laughs> and um, and um, even though uh, uh, Holly is settling for less, um, it you know it is it is 
it is a wonderful thing to see. So uh, truth, to see Dan, Dan that's, that's strike the truth. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see Dan swing so high above his station. Uh, so, <laughs> I believe that to be the truth uh, from Peter. So, okay, so, so Chris, so a question for Peter. Let, let us see if we can, because hmm. if we can't beat Peter, then how on earth is a Xbox 360 game going to have any choice with its unique voice calibration system? Going to do it. Right, okay, Chris. Um, I, I've just gone on the site and I've just put, I've just typed in awkward questions to ask people. Great, <laughs> good, just great. For, yeah, so I thought that top is of the absolutely li- the thing you would do, Chris. Yeah, top of the list, Peter. Who is your least favourite friend? Who is my least favourite friend? Your least favourite friend. And this is, can be true, true or false, can't it? It can be whatever you want. It can be whatever you want. You've got yeah. the control. Sam's mm. given us the control question. You've given us the control answer. Who is your least favourite friend? Uh, my least favourite friend is a guy called. Um, Richard, who I work with, um, he is a person who, you know, the kind of people who, you know, the kind of people like you would say were associate, like good associate, not really associates, but good associates, like more than colleagues, but not, not like if they ask off. if they ask you to lend you some money for a coffee, you'd lend them some money for a coffee. You would lend them, yeah, but you, as far but as you would go, lend yeah. them about a fiver, and uh, after that. Yeah, like and you'd, want it, and you'd want it back, and you would want it back pretty quickly. So yeah, I would say probably Richard. Okay, all right, um, go on down. Your question. Uh, I too have searched for awkward questions. God's um, sake! So I, I love the amount of creativity that is in our group. Mm. Bodes well. Bodes go well. On. For future things. Peter. Yeah. If you think no one is looking. Mm. What is the one thing that you would do? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the one there were thing, much worse ones I could have asked. The one, the one thing that... Uh, so no, nobody at all would be looking. So no one can see you, no one's looking. Yeah. What's the one thing you'd do? You, you, you're, in the middle, you're in public, but no one can see you. For some reason, everyone's looking the other way. What's the one thing? Yeah, all the CCTV do? cameras, you're in a blind spot there. No matter what you do, you'll get away with it. No one will spot it. What would you do? <laughs> <laughs> Um, my word. Um, do you know, I think I would... I would wrap my hand uh, in a piece of cloth, maybe take off my jumper, wrap it up, uh, wrap up my hand in it, and I would smash a window. I would smash a window just to see what it was like to put my fist through one. Because I, 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 I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to do it to anybody... Uh, and I wouldn't, but but if I could get away, and it's quite expensive, but if I could get away with doing it, I'd totally do that. A shop window, a Vodafone shop window. <laughs> okay. it sounds it sounds like he's recounting it from a psycho psycho psychoanalyst couch now. Yeah, yeah but he might by the end of it, he's going to be breaking into the shop and stealing the place. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't want to steal anything. No, I wouldn't want to steal anything. But Just I would smash. smash I would smash a window of a shop that I thought was. Was um, was was morally bankrupt. They could they could easily afford to repair it. Yeah. Right then. So uh, let's have opinion. Dan, do you, both truths, lie lie, I, or truth I lie. I think, I think uh, the first one was a lie, and the second one was a truth. See, I go with I go with that as well, Chris. I go with that as well, just because. Um, I don't think he has a friend called Richard. No, no, no. I'm just because Pete did that thing of getting us to try and kind of empathise with him by saying, you know, that kind of person. So straight away, it kind of gets us to go, yeah, 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 I know. And we're kind of halfway to believing him already, that kind of thing, which makes me think that's a lie. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, well, exactly. Yes. Boom. Have Have we got it right? Yeah, you've absolutely yeah, got you, exactly. absolutely spot on. Because Basically. that's the human element. Yeah. The human element. Like but but if you put that into a cold hard machine, it doesn't understand. It doesn't understand like these little psychological tricks that you try and fail to employ. And it, it doesn't it doesn't understand like it doesn't understand that you it doesn't understand that you're going through a thought process to put together the truth. So, for example, I was think I was getting into the truth. I was just like, I would probably do that, and then oh, I would do this, and I would do that, and I would do that. But to a cold hard machine, it's just thinking, 
input, input, input. It's not thinking. It's just thinking one zero. You're one, not. You're zero. not hearing yeah. the train. Of it's, thought. it's not. It's not thinking. Yeah. It's not he- hearing the train of thought. Exactly. That's you're bang on the money there, Dan. <laughs> Dan, this is what you received from your secret Santa. OK, I've got my envelope open now, uh, but mine isn't wrapped, so I haven't taken it out yet, so let's have a little look. It, it's, a, it's a PS3 box. Oh, my God. Ooh. Ooh. Now, Dan, this is, this is new for you, isn't it? Someone, Getting someone something that's been made that. within the last five years. And not out of clay. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that this person feels that I have enough time to play this game between now and Twelfth Night. Um, okay. What is it? Dan? This person has decided to bestow on me one of the longest games I think is around, <laughs> as they have purchased for me the Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Oh my <laughs> word! <laughs> somehow well, I've got to play pounds. these between now and Twelfth Night. Ah, uh, now Dan. Yes. Technically, you don't have to play at all. Technically, you're incorrect because it is possible to complete um, uh, Oblivion in four hours. The main story. Well, let's see then. Well, this is, this is <laughs> what I've got. I'm, it's my chance I mean, to turn the tide of darkness with the Empire ready to crumble, the gates of oblivion open and demons march upon the land. You must find the lost heir to the throne and unravel the sinister plot that threatens to destroy all of Tamriel. I try to enjoy and experience many different genres of games. A quick look at my gaming shelf will show you a selection of platformers, sports sims, first-person shooters and third-person action-adventure games. However, one style which I've always struggled with is the open world RPGs. Whilst I have dabbled with Morrowind and put in a fair bit of time into Fallout 3, this genre of game has never really grabbed me, which meant when I unwrapped this year's Secret Santa gift, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, it gave me a fresh opportunity to enjoy a style of game which has eluded me for so long. From reading articles and researching this game, it is clear that Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is not a game that will be able to be fully completed in the short period I have between the Free Play Christmas Special and the Twelfth Night Special. However, with this, I endeavour to give you the best assessment of my experience as I can. initial thought I have when I start this game is its size. After a basic tutorial which explains the core control scheme, you are left in the open with very little instruction on what to do next. Whilst for many players this gives them the opportunity to explore a whole new world at their own pace, for me this is one of the reasons why this genre has always been a struggle. Whilst I can enjoy an element of exploration, I prefer to have a clear narrative. Often with the open world structure, I am left distracted and I lose track of the main story. This is why I've never been able to fully enjoy the likes of Fallout, Grand Theft Auto or an MMO like World of Warcraft. But this time I wasn't going to allow myself to become distracted. I wanted to focus on the main story so I could get a good experience of what this game is. To start with I should state that Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is a graphically sublime game with a rich mythology and enough quests to keep a seasoned RPG player happy for a long long time. I feel it is important to state this because unfortunately my lack of experience as an RPG player prevented me from truly experiencing the best elements of this title. Whilst as I mentioned there is a brief tutorial at the start of the game all this covers is the basics revolving around the core control mechanics and the creation of your character. Straight away, this was a hurdle for me, not having the extensive experience of playing these types of games. When I am asked very, very early on to choose the race and class of my character, I'm left trying to make a decision which is not based on anything other than a very, very surface idea of how I think I might want to proceed in the game. I don't fully understand why I should choose to be a thief, a rogue, a nightblade or any of the other 18 different classes. 
The problem here is that at the point at which this decision is to be made, my sole gameplay has involved exploring the dungeons and caves below the palace of the Emperor, whilst immediately after finalising my decision, I then leave the catacombs and are thrust into an open world completely different to the environment I have based my decisions on. So here I am, a tall Nordic thief with a ponytail and beard ready to take on the realm of Tamriel. So where do I start? And herein lies the problem. Where do I start? I know I have to meet someone and there is a marker on my compass telling me the direction, but not much else. On my travels I quickly encounter my most hated of gaming enemies, the crab, and then a wolf who chases me. Normally these types of small enemies will be quite quickly dispatched, but my character at the moment seems to lose health at an alarming rate and doles out damage like a kitten with a toothpick. Clearly I need to level up and do it fast, but I don't know how to do that. After playing for a while, meeting various enemies and progressing the story somewhat, I seem to be honing in on a few key attributes I want to pursue. For example, I decide that I want to be a proficient archer. However, as many arrows as I fire, I don't seem to be improving. The problem I have is that I can't build my character without instruction, but these are instructions the game seems unwilling to give me. In years gone by, I have been intuitively able to work out how a game works and how I need to play. After that, the game would often help me with any instructions that weren't quite clear enough. However, has this reliance on assistance meant that now, when a game doesn't put it on a plate for me, I can no longer work it out for myself? In short, what I would like to discuss is that, as gamers, are we getting worse? Okay, so as gamers, are we getting worse? Do you want the simple answer? Yes, please. Uh, no. Can we have the, okay, uh, what about the non, answer? not so simple answer? <laughs> um, <laughs> as gamers, we are now more te technically proficient. Uh, we have more understanding. We can deal with more complex tasks than we ever could, even... Not even looking back ten years ago, even looking back a year ago, um, the games that we're dealing with and the methods of input and dealing with multiple things. Like the other day, right, I went to HMV and I went to go and play an Xbox One. And as, as I was playing that game, I had to deal with knowing how to get rid of all the panels that were coming up from the dashboard. Like, oh, do you want to go on Skype? Do you want to do all that? And as a gamer, I had to deal with that. And because I'm a gamer in this current generation, I know the principles of a controller. I know kind of the logistics of a computer. I was able to deal with that, with, with that kind of that, that problem that we now have gamers have. If you've ever played Deadly Premonition, you know as a gamer that mm. you can actually be quite technically proficient when it comes to, you know, the car controls and things like that. If you've played um, games like uh, DMC or Bayonetta, learning different combo patterns um, and um, how to deliver it and juggling people, tactics in FIFA, um, any sort of tactical play from, like, Civ Five to SimCity... Um, anything like that. As gamers now, we're, I don't think we're becoming worse. I think, like, in, in your case, Dan, I think th that method of gameplay comes from an assumption that you've played these games before. And I think in certain games, we are mollycoddled slightly. And I think that can hamper a bit of the gameplay, but I don't think it... I don't think it necessarily has a detrimental effect on our skills as gamers. But I think one of the, I mean, the points that I raised is that in years back when, you, when, when I was younger, when I'd play a game, there wouldn't necessarily be kind of extensive tutorials, but I would naturally be able to pick up what the game wanted me to do and how to do it, and I'd naturally be able to do that. Yeah, because, all, you, because all you'd be doing in that game is running from one side of the screen to the other and pressing one button to jump. Not necessarily. So, th so therefore, so therefore, that's all you need to know. 
Whereas now you have to have extensive tutorials because in The Last of Us, you've got to find cover. You've got to shoot. You've got to manage your pack. You've got to put it all together. And by the end of 30 minutes, you know how to do all that. Fair enough, there's a bit of a tutorial process. But to say that we're getting worse just because we have to have 30 minutes of explaining how it's done, I personally, I think it's quite impressive that we learn how to handle all of it but we, pref we in 30 minutes. Yeah, it takes probably three hours to perfect it, but the fact that we know how to handle it in 30 minutes shows as gamers that we are becoming definitely more proficient. But when that tutorial isn't there in a, in a situation like this... Um, Obviously, I'm only speaking from my own point of view, but the, it puts up a huge barrier that perhaps there shouldn't be there. Of course, we, we talk about the fact that maybe this game in particular relies on an, a, a pre-existing knowledge, but I don't think any game should rely on a pre-existing knowledge of the mechanics of a game. They should all bring, bring in, try and bring in a new player. So, and therefore, the so, therefore so, so shouldn't your question therefore be, are games becoming too technical? Are they too complicated like the fact that the, the Wii was so successful because it broke down that barrier that people were having when they looked at the PS3 controller and saw that it had 10 buttons and people didn't know know how to use six axis mm. on a two-handed controller the Wii comes along you just got to press one button waggle something like you do in real life and you know yeah. it works when well, grandma I mean, when grandma said how do I swing the tennis racket you said swing the tennis racket grandma yeah well, then that's the thing. Is it, is it a case of the player is the problem or the game or the system is the problem then? I, I think it's a, this is, a, this is a, an odd conversation. I think actually it's, it's neither. It's that games are becoming more and more culturally acceptable to a wider audience. So they're starting to learn that we need to include people more readily. So... For example, you know, you know, games are tutorialized a fair amount, but I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as a... Uh, let's go back to The Last of Us. The Last of Us had television advertising. It was advertising to people who necessarily didn't play video games. It was, here is a cinematic experience. Do you like going to the cinema and seeing brutal-ass movies? Well, guess what? we got a game for you. You know, it's the same with um, Heavy Rain and that, uh, and that sort of thing. The reason that they are tutorialized is because these big companies, since they are making huge AAA games with budgets stretching into hundreds of millions of dollars, they want the wi a wide as, uh, as wide an audience as possible. And not tutorializing, not making things easy to begin with, it's simply, it's simply unacceptable to, to the kind of crowd that, that doesn't have the prerequisite knowledge of, in Call of Duty, you press L2, then R2 to fire. Like, you know, you, you can't appeal to that. So I, I think it's a, a case of shifting expectations from people who play video games. It's, it's not us playing, you know... We're quite a diverse group of people who play games, but at the end of the day, we are, you know, white males from from a Western culture with, de uh, you know, decent amounts of money. Like, we are not necessarily, you know, we, we are still the core audience, but we are not the only audience anymore. Um, so I, th I think it's I think it's that, and obviously that sort of manifests itself in you know games becoming simpler or games becoming more straightforward or games holding your hand a little bit too much. I think it, you're absolutely right, Pete. It's this, it's this codification of gaming. Like, when we w play any game, we have to learn the codes and conventions that make it up. And it's not just the mechanics of it. It's also the narrative of that play world that we're engaging with. When we watch a film, we actually do have to kind of teach ourselves to watch a film because every genre, every um, fictional world has its own set of rules, and some of these are very extreme, like science fiction. Um, and some of these are like genre-specific, like in horror films, there are certain kind of genre conventions that we kind of we teach ourselves to recognise and be aware of. It doesn't mean that it's any it's not any scarier for us or any less scarier for us. Um, and it's the same with gaming, really. I think that, as you say, Pete, as um, we've become more inclusive, um, gaming is is branching out into a variety of different genres, and this injection of the film um, influences into it more and more so has kind of enhanced and in, uh, increased the breadth of the codes in which it draws from and that we have to learn.
Could you could you could there be an argument, Dan, for for a game like um, Elder Scrolls to actually benefit from having a stripped down or let's say a more what's the word a more comprehensive tutorial, as in it doesn't bombard you all at once. Now I, I say this because I watch quite a lot of let's play videos of of people starting um, games from the start, and I see, especially with a lot of RPGs, that there are some titles out there, especially on the PC, that within the first five minutes you have a lot of information thrust upon you. And personally, as a gamer, I would find that quite off-putting. I'd quite like to, like, for example, when you, when you first play Fallout 3, all you're taught is how to talk, defend yourself, sleep, and that's about it. Everything else you learn as you play. Now, surely there is a slight benefit from such a complex and overburdened world like Elder Scrolls to have a slimmed-down tutorial. I, I, I would agree with you. I've played Fallout 3, and obviously in kind of the, the genres, they're, they're similar because of what, what they try and do. Um, and I, I did enjoy Fallout 3 a lot more than I, than I had, especially the start of starting with Oblivion. Um, and I think, for me, there was the, some of the key aspects... Um, about Oblivion was were the things that bothered me. The fact that I couldn't, I didn't know theoretically how to level up or how the best way of leveling up because he didn't tell you. Every now and again, it would just pop up saying, you've gone up a level. I didn't know what I'd done and it didn't give me any instruction of if you want to kind of work on maybe going up levels, try and do this or do this. Just, it didn't need to hold my hand in the sense of you have to do this now to, to, to progress. Just to give me the information in some form, just you can drip feed it to me as long as that's coming. So as long as that information is coming to me, um, that's fine. The problem I have is where there's no information. I only know certain things from going on forums and looking at FAQs where it talks about um, going to guilds and factions and training centers where that allows you to level up really quickly and really easily. The game has told me none of that, and that's the, that's the issue that I've had. What, what the do fact you get told in the tutorial? There must be a tutorial of some sort. The, con- the tutorial basically revolves around how- controlling the character, um, and it tells you how to access your uh, your inventory. At no point has the game told me how to do fast travel. I've had to work that out by myself, and that. And at no point, it wasn't until I realised from looking on forums that I realised that certain places you have to discover before you can fast travel to them because I didn't understand why they weren't necessarily working. So it doesn't tell me those things. This tutorial basically runs me through combat and the combat is, is basically one or two buttons if it's magic it's r2 and if it's melee it's r1 and that's basically it but isn't that so, but isn't that an exciting part of entering into an rpg the fact that you just left out into the world and all you've got is 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 you just know how to defend yourself isn't that exciting it is, but when you're not strong enough to be able to fight off some of the enemies that are coming to you, it's very, very quickly becomes very frustrating. And when you can't, when you combine it with a few, some of the other things I mentioned, stuff like um, ch- really poor checkpointing. So when you do die, you are taken so far back that you have to go through so much again because you can't fast travel. You have to take a long time to get there. It quickly becomes very frustrating, um, and that 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 was a problem that kind of combined with those things. Uh, there is an element where you can say that it's exciting so you have to discover it yourself, but on the other flip side of it, I don't know where I'm going. And so when things happen and the, I, I'm, I'm defeated by an enemy, so I don't really understand why I've been defeated. I seem to be doing the right thing. I, I'm, I'm swinging my sword, I'm holding my shield up, but I'm dying, and I don't really understand why because the game hasn't been able to help me along and just inform me, okay, you're doing this wrong, you need to do like this, or you need to do like this, or before, right at the start, say, okay, there are different ways of battling, do this or this, rather than just the very base level, press this button to swing a sword, press this button to throw a spell. That's about it. So going back to your original question then, does that mean you're a terrible gamer? Does that mean as a gamer you're awful, you're getting worse, because you don't know how to deal with that? Well, that's the, thing. I don't, I'm, that's the question I'm asking, because is this because, maybe it's because I've been mollycoddled, has that in the past... Has that made me a worse gamer? So when a game doesn't do this, when it doesn't mollycoddle me, and I'm faced with having to deal with it all myself, I now can't handle it, where in the past I might have been able to. Have, have I become a worse gamer from the games of today? 
Or have you just become a worse gamer for RPGs, Dan? Maybe is it maybe is it just a genre thing? Because you've you've played some RPGs in the past. You've recently been playing Final Fantasy, and you have played an Elder Scrolls game before, but you didn't complete either of those. Am I right in saying that? No, and a lot of that's down to the length of them. I mean, Final Fantasy is quite a long game, um, and I've it gets I've... good thirty hours in though, Dan. Stick <laughs> yeah, with it. That's what people but, keep but, telling. Uh, hence, hence, probably why the the tutorial is such so drawn out. Because to be the, fair, after 13 hours of, of tutorial for Final Fantasy, I'm still getting tutorials. So it's maybe, ridiculous. I'm still getting new features being added. So that's the flip side. On the other side, it'll give you everything and just space it out over a really long period of time, which gets frustrating because uh, 13 hours in, I'm thinking, stop giving me new things to do. Stop this, changing the, the game, the, the playing surface again. Because if this was a scientific experiment, they'd ha- they'd have you play games from a variety of genres, a variety of lengths and variety of difficulties to kind of gauge your ability. Uh, kind of like how we had the control set of questions for Pete when we were trying to deduce whether he was lying or not. It, having you just draw from one particular game or even one particular genre wouldn't be enough. So looking at your kind of your game playing as a whole, would you say you're still a, a worse gamer than the standard? Or then, or then you were, yeah. Because you, you, you said that you, you, when you used to, you used to flick on a game, turn it on, bush, bash, bosh, you're in. Completed. Five minutes. Five Easy. minutes. Done. Dust your hands off. But okay. now, but now you're struggling with Elder Scrolls. What's yeah. happened, Dan? What's no, happened, you, Dan? No, Dan. Peggle. Yeah. What's happened, Dan? What has happened? <laughs> well, I look at it and you think, okay, if I was, if I was compare the game of Oblivion, the only get the game that I probably most closely related to that would be Fallout 3. And I, they didn't have this obstacle with that. And that was quite a few years ago that I played that game. And I, I didn't have that issue. I didn't have that problem that I've experienced with this. So the experience I have tells me that I used to be able to do these kind of games, that I used to be able to play these. However, now I'm really struggling and I'm fighting against it. And so something has changed. Now, is that just I'm getting older? <laughs> My brain's I think, not I think also it fall, Fallout 3 is, is, uh, came out after oblivion i think if you if you went back and tried to play elder scrolls arena i think you'd be even more flummoxed uh so i don't know i think i think that's also partly to do with the fact that we get better at making games so so are we saying that the fitter dan gets the worse at gaming he gets most definitely possibly his, his, his mind his mind is becoming adult all that interval training dan yeah take a break from it then just see, I'll have an interval day. in the I'll interval. Just get fat and I'll become a blob and I'll be absolutely fine. Spread out your I'll intervals be... in your interval training. Play Oblivion. So instead of so instead of a minute rest, a few days, Come five minutes, minute yeah. run, a few days rest. So five minute run, play Oblivion for three days, five minute run. Yeah. Is that what, is that, yeah, that what, you're, yeah, is that what yeah, you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, and then you'd okay. be a lot, and then you'd be a lot better gamer. Oh, I see. So I'm just going to introduce mine, but we'll just have rapping as usual. Okay, so let's Rope, cast Rope on. in the Chris, <laughs> look at the diss. Oh, no, what I've got? I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's cast our minds back to what I received for Christmas. Okay, I've, I've managed to get into the envelope. Fortunately, my Santa's used this envelope in a previous... Uh, <laughs> So it, it didn't take too long to get into it. It's a it's a PlayStation Three game. All right, this is good. We get, we've got yeah. some good games this year. What, what? Yeah, go on. I have got, gentlemen, uh, Ubisoft, the Prince of Persia, on the PlayStation Three. Mm, what the uh, one with Nolan North in? I believe. Is that it the is. one yes, where you is. throw a woman? That is the one where you. That is basically Dan. Where to quote Pete, it's throwing a woman <laughs> is the most uh, the best, the the weapon in game. Better than a chainsaw yeah. lance. Probably, I think our quote of 2013. To be I honest, don't, I think I don't think you've. You know, I, I, I don't know if I don't oh, know wow. if anybody else would agree, but um, I don't think you've experienced the last generation of gaming until you've thrown a woman <laughs> at an enemy. Deja vu. 
That was the first thing I thought of when I popped my secret Santa present into my PlayStation 3. Deja vu. That moment where the brain briefly glimpses an object before it has processed it, giving the strong sensation of encountering something that we feel we've experienced already. I'd played Ubisoft's 2008 reboot of The Prince of Persia briefly before, with my colleagues Pete and Sam, but that was not the reason for my double take. I'm quiet now. The game sees you playing the part of a nameless dashing thief, who, whilst looking for his donkey, collides with a mysterious princess called Elika. Together they have to save the world from darkness, combining Elika's magic with the nameless hero's brawn to defeat the enemy. So far, so predictable. While cell shading is not my cup of tea, I quickly acclimatise to it. Its cartoonish quality, complementing the death-defying leaps and sword-swinging swirls through this Western Asian playground. Trust me. It's a mindless romp of inaccuracies. The Hollywoodized English and striking visuals prevent it from being taken seriously. And I'm not sure it wants to be taken seriously. I'm fine with this, except it does get a little repetitive after a while with all the sliding, jumping and swinging. But this repetition isn't the source of my deja vu. I'm being held hostage by a group of scientists. Now, in an infamous episode of Raw, my colleague Pete suggested the character of Elika as one of the top ten weapons in gaming. Now, at the time, I was uncomfortable with such a suggestion, and still am, particularly with regards to the objectification of women. However, you don't actually throw Elika in the game. Ironically... It is she that throws you. Whilst we're on the subject of being thrown by Alika, one of the discussion topics I considered raising was how difficult it is to die in the game. If the protagonist mistimes a jump, Alika is there to grab your hand and pull you back to the beginning, even when she's tied up. Now, this is not something new in gaming, with Batman Arkham Asylum being another example. Although it lessens the disruption to the flow of the game, it does make your character appear a little clumsy. When we die in gaming, we fall into the Groundhog Day mentality of being able to right our previous wrongs. Here, unable to die, the overall timeline becomes a little messy. You won't tell me what you're looking for or why you This want echo of Arkham Asylum is one of the reasons why I felt deja vu whenever I fell off the edge. The second lies in another of Ubisoft's Montreal games. That's the Assassin's Creed series. I'd not long played Assassin's Creed Revelations, and easily found a resonance between the free running of Ezio and the nameless hero of Prince of Persia. <laughs> you devil. Yet this combined with the links to Arkham Asylum are secondary with regards to the principal reason for my deja vu, and one of my major gripes of the game. Sorry, but it is. You see, throughout this provocation, I've played you audio clips. However, none of them are from the Prince of Persia. In fact, they are from more than one gaming franchise. They are all, however, one voice. Nolan North. I hold men's lives in my hands. The voice of Desmond Miles in the Assassin's Creed series, and Nathan Drake in Uncharted. Both of these are world-famous franchises that have garnered millions of players. Nolan North has become one of the busiest voiceover artists in the business, heard in numerous titles. The problem is that he runs the risk of hourly tripping himself up because of this fact. Now, in a film, this is a common occurrence. Jack Black has donated his voice to Shark Tale and Kung Fu Panda with little alteration to his voice. Eddie Murphy has done the same with Mulan and Shrek. So why do I find this so jarring in gaming? Well, it's to do with interactivity. Gaming is a reactive medium. I'm not just watching an animated film with the voice of Nolan North. I'm controlling Nathan Drake in a game of Assassin's Creed. It's not just visual memory, it's muscle memory as well. Now, Nolan North can be quite chameleonic in some of his roles. However, his normal voice has become increasingly recognisable. This brings me to the question that I want to pitch. Can an iconic gaming voice transfer to another gaming franchise successfully? gentlemen can an iconic gaming voice transfer to another gaming franchise successfully hmm 
So, who are the iconic voices? I suppose there's Duke Nukem, David Hayter, mm. uh, Peter Wellington. Peter Wellington, obviously, voice of Sepulchre, voice of uh, <laughs> sorts of good stuff like that. Uh, well, I thought of, I thought of you, Pete, when posing this topic because of your experiences working as a voiceover artist in gaming quite recently actually was that mm. something you were conscious of um moving between roles like kind of almost masking your rp voice as it were um mm. no because simply because a there wasn't enough work and b uh there the the roles that kind of were landed were were different enough to the point that it could sound different. It was... It's a curious question, because you want to hire a voice actor because they can act well. Um, and I think, I think we can... I think we can all agree that Nolan North is a superb voice actor. Um, yeah. And actor. He does motion capture as well, doesn't he, of course? Yeah, yeah, he does. And in fact, he's been in a, cu- a couple of episodes of TV series in America as well. Um... But, yeah, I don't know. Um, who is the voice of Duke Nukem? John St. John, that's the one. He's done all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, so I would say Duke Nukem is a very notable, you know, it's a very notable character. You all know what he sounds like. But he's also been in America's Army. Uh, he's been in Guild Wars... Dota, Runaway, Dream of the Turtle, which is a point-and-click adventure, Spellforce. The thing, the thing that, that I think is, and I think this might just be the Nolan North problem, that producers have heard him doing the Uncharted thing and gone, yeah, we want that. And, yeah. I, can, and I can imagine him going into the studio and as Desmond Miles and going, I imagine him to have this kind of voice. And all the producers and Ubisoft sitting there going, well, "It's good, it's good." But we were thinking mm. more. Mm. It's, it's not Nathan Drake. Could you do? Could you Nathan? just say, "Oh crap"? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I and I wonder, like, for because like Nolan North played Deadpool recently, and he actually yeah. got quite a lot of plaudits for that role because he, you know, he was kind of different. Of course, he's Penguin as well. Yeah, in, in the Arkham, Arkham game, City, and so he. Um, he obviously has a range and he has a very talented voice. I wonder whether his voice as Nathan Drake has just become assailable. It's become too iconic. Like, um, I think it would be really interesting that David Hayter's appearing in a stealth game called Republic on the iPad and iOS and whatever. So, having not played it, I can't, I can't, you know, it's but, force, but but it'd be interesting to see what the reaction is to having such an iconic uh, voice associated with stealth appearing in another stealth title, especially a stealth title made by Ryan Payton. I think I think the points we're making here. I think a great a great voice actor hasn't just got the one voice. Um, so, if, as for example, Nolan North, you know, we know the voice of Nathan Drake, and that's obviously the one that certain producer will want a game, but as you just mentioned, some of the voices he's done there, and you also remember his, his role in The Last of Us, which I didn't realise to him until I was told, because he was unrecognisable, but yet still a fantastic performance. Yeah, if you and look so at I his think, Wikipedia page... Um... The roles he's played, are, are, the, the scope of roles that he's played are fantastic, you and know you never know of, he's Dan, in certain roles. Dan, me and you have played Army of Two. Do you know it's he's in that? Is he? Yeah. So there, there's the thing, these are... Of, you shouldn't hear something and say, there's Nolan North. That's a voice actor, you shouldn't necessarily hear that. You want to hear the character that's exactly. there. Exactly. And I didn't um, get that when I was playing the Prince of Persia. I, I was just very conscious of the fact that I, it felt like he was possessed by the voice of Nathan Drake. It was such a bizarre thing for me. Well, that's obviously what they wanted, wasn't it? They, they yeah, wanted a sort of... The, the prince is... Well, the way they cast him in that... And it's one of the reasons I didn't really like the game was that he was kind of like this hapless hero with a, a rubbish donkey... Yeah, and uh, the the character was just too similar to Nathan Drake, and the lines were blurred. And unfortunately, you know, the voice can only do so much. And I bet he tried. 
I bet he I mean, tried. This is the same thing across kind of all mediums as well. There'll be films where you'll have a, a great film performance. You, you look at someone like Robert De Niro. The amount of roles that he's played and he's been asked to play, which are basically variations on his Travis Bickle or variations of his uh, Corleone from Godfather Part Two, because that's what people want him to do. And so he's had to just do variations on them. On another role where he has to do something completely different, he's fantastic. And it's across so many different medias now, mediums now, that something successful, in this case, he, the, the Nathan Drake voice, that they just desperately want to bottle that. But and it's not, it's, it's, it's such a shame for the person behind the voice or the person behind the role that they're then not able to expand and do interesting things. Because all these people are creative people. They want to try interesting things with what the God-given talents that they have. And it's, it's just a shame when they're not able to do that. And I think, to be fair, it's just as you've experienced here, Chris, it's actually the, to the detriment of the game rather than being in its favour. Yeah, and I think going back to the question and something you've picked on there, Dan, in terms of like the filmic presence of of actors, is that I don't think you can you can cross that I I don't think an iconic voice can cross franchises when the franchises are so similar. So mm. Uncharted, Prince of Persia, um, to some extent, Assassin's Creed and Desmond Miles, all third person action adventures. They involve a little bit of climbing. A little bit of shooty shooty and general fighting, and and wise cracking and wise cracking. And the thing is, is that like you think about the physicality of those roles, and as all of us actors, we have to think about this. That in order to do that, they all have to be live. Their voices are going to be naturally quite um, in, in that sort of upper register because they're not going to be carrying that much heft because of the physicality and the actions that they do. And then the way the character is written as well. As a voice actor, he would have been encouraged not to be able to do much, whereas in Army of Two, he's playing... Uh, yeah, it's a third-person action game, but he's, you know, he's, he's playing a bro, isn't he? He's playing, he, he's playing a, a jarhead. So the performance there is a, is, a, is a lot different. So I think, in a way, you're right, Chris, but I think it's only when the franchise replicates what made them iconic in the first place. <laughs> Dan, this is what you unwrapped. No, it's not been wrapped. Am I the only... Well... Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, am I the only one who bothered to wrap anything? Oh, um, well, we can't really say. Well, I don't... Oh. Well, no one else's was wrapped. I think the wrapping is the packaging on the outside, isn't it? Well, well I, I'm th- not, I'm I think my sons have got lucky it, that the Royal Mail gave it an extra to, I try to deflect it from being me by stuffing lots of confetti in there, because that's what Chris did with, to me one year. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was hilarious. I'd say my nan did that for my birthday, but she, because I turned 28, for some reason she filled it with 20, little 21s. Little 21? Because <laughs> you turned 28? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe her iPhone has gone like a year backwards or something, I don't know. Um, right. Um, okay. It's a colourful, colourful and engaging gaming experience on the Xbox 360. Mm. Um, 70 hours. Who's it by? It's by Rare. It's the sequel to the actually qu- really quite popular Xbox title, Viva Piñata. It's Viva Piñata Trouble in Paradise. This year, Santa has bestowed upon me the gift of Viva Piñata, Trouble in Paradise. To be fair, I probably deserve this. Viva Piñata has been a title that has for no reason whatsoever, received scorn and indignation from me for doing nothing more than existing on the shelf. Its colourful premise and childish nature seemed to strike a negative chord with me, and I dismissed such a title 
as nothing more than a piece of shovelware, and a sign that the once great British developer Rare had succumbed to the pressure of being partnered with a much bigger and more powerful corporation. Secretly, though, I've always been intrigued by the title, especially seeing as both of the games, Viva Piñata and Trouble in Paradise, released in 2006 and 2008 respectively, seem to attract interesting and encouraging favour from critics and fans. The premise of the title is simple and based around many world creation mechanics that have now become common parts of our gaming vocabulary. You take the role of a gardener, and your chief duty is to attract the piñata inhabitants of the island, make them happy, and once they're filled with candy, send them off to a party. No doubt to be eviscerated by a small child with a baseball bat. The conceit is easy to get your head around, but it isn't that comforting. The animations of the creatures are so varied, so personal, that it's extremely difficult not to get attached to the cute creatures that you're trying to attract to your garden. In the end, to try and help with the negative implications of comforting and housing what is nothing more than a small, cuddly, disposable party gift, I employed a couple of coping mechanisms one of which was to name the small blighters with the most horrific and ugly names that I could possibly think of. After a short while, my garden was full to the brim of various creatures with a range of names stretching from Flingus, Dungface, Rash Scare, all the way to a resurgence of Beardy Balls. The way I saw it is, if they had a despicable name, I wouldn't feel so bad about their impending doom. Instead of running an effective habitat for their grooming, I instead was the chief ward of a piñata hospice. Viva Piñata Trouble in Paradise, when stripped down, is effectively based around your usual village creation mechanics. Items take time to build, creatures eat up minutes to grow, and unlocking new items take experience, which, as we all know, take hours to cultivate. However, unlike many systems that we're used to where you can possibly be waiting days for certain creation processes to come to fruition, Trouble in Paradise seems to treat your time as a gamer more preciously than others. Devices and mechanics do take an age to complete, yes, but the length of time has been perfectly judged by Rare, so you're never waiting too long or the experience isn't over too soon. Unlike many games that share the same mechanic, you're not scratching around for gold stars to hurry up the arduous task. Instead, you're busy admiring the landscape, animations, or dealing in many of the interesting styles of play. So, what I wanted to discuss with the group is, how valuable is our time as gamers? How important is it for titles to make sure that they're not wasting our valuable hours on this earth? And should they be doing more to capture our attention sooner. Okay, so how valuable is our time as gamers? I'm going to come in with what some may consider to be quite a controversial statement. Um, Because it kind of goes against what majority of gamers probably think. 
And at the end of the day, for me, gaming can be quite a bit of a waste of time. And it can be um, a way of passing time that I'm not getting anything out of. It's just literally the minutes are passing by. Very, Very few times in recent years I've played a video game that I felt has... I've spent a. I've gained something from the time I spent with the game. Last of Us would probably be the most recent example. I felt that I got something back from the time I spent with it. This it's the same with across all mediums. There are films I will watch and think, well, I've just wasted two hours of my life. Um, with games, you're wasting three, four, five. If you're playing Oblivion, twenty hours of your life. Well, with if you're playing Oblivion, Yata, seventy too. hours. <laughs> you're, you're you're spending a lot longer with these games, and I think that. Most of these games, they take up such a large portion of our time, and yet they don't actually give us anything back in return. They're just basically time consumption devices. Um, I know probably a lot of people, that kind of feeds into what a lot of people would argue about games are a waste of time, and they're not overall. They're not completely a waste of time, but there's a lot of stuff out there that kind of is, and I think they don't value the time that we have as much as we're putting into them. It depends what you class as being a waste of time, really. Doesn't it? Like, don't, would do you... would watching all all episodes of um, like season four of Breaking Bad be as much a waste of time as sitting down and playing a game for what, twelve episodes, forty minutes each for twelve hours straight? It depends on the content. If you would say to me, uh, watch season four of Breaking Bad, play start to finish of The Last of Us. I'm getting something from both of those experiences. If you say to me, season four of Breaking Bad or 12 hours of Duke Nukem Land of the Babes, <laughs> then I'm getting nothing from that. I'm getting nothing out of that, but I'm getting a lot from the, the one medium. It's yeah, about the content. But, 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 the thing is, but the thing is, the difference between the two contents and in terms of the time is that you're putting something in to Duke Nukem. You're not putting anything in to Breaking Bad. You're taking, but, you're taking, you're taking from one from one medium, but you're actually putting something into another. And so, therefore, does that mean that you value your time more highly over over a game than you do, say, a TV than watching a TV show, which is essentially a lot more of a it, which is a passive activity, whereas a game oh, you're you're putting in information, which means that therefore my time is a lot more valuable here. Whilst I'm I'm aware that. What I'm about to say could lead us very much off topic. I don't think necessarily um, television, in a certain sense, is a completely passive experience. I feel that I, um, although I'm not interact, I don't have, I have no effect on the television. What the content is, like I do with games. Obviously, you're in control of the game. Um, I'm still there is still an interaction, kind of uh, subconsciously for me, that I'm interacting with the TV, and it's. If it's completely passive, then I wouldn't get as much out of it as I do. I'm invested it's within. A pas- it's that a passive, but it's a passive interaction. But your, your subconscious is working there. out. Your subconscious is working out the narrative. It's putting the strands together. It's it's, bring, physi- it's, it's bringing it's, out. It's physically emo- passive, but it's mentally not. I just, also, as I say, with, with games, obviously there is that physicality of you controlling a game, so you are involved with that sense. Yeah, so, that, so, that's, so, so that's the question that I'm asking. Because you have this physical interactivity with the product, because you've physically got to get past barriers, because you've physically got to um, learn things and you've physically got to um, essentially get better as the game goes on, whereas you don't really have to do that when you're watching a TV show, um, any TV show, um, is that why you value your game time more? Um, I, I see. I see your point, and there is there is an element of that. And so, obviously, it co- it kind of comes from the, the the games developers that how how much they value our time because um, they're the ones producing this content. They know we're going to take up a number of hours. Um, do they value it as highly as we do? I've got. I can't game that, that much. I spent an hour a day at most being able to game and that's quite rare maybe i do that maybe twice a week that time is valuable to me because the current the life that i lead i don't have time to be able to um play game all the time i have responsibilities that so my my time as a gamer is valuable so i want to fill that with um content which is good enough for me to spend that time so for me in my own personal thing that amount of time is very valuable to me because i've got such a finite amount of time to play that it's 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 very important to me. 
I think I think one of the questions we should really be asking is kind of how we use our time, because when we have a book, we don't tend to read it all in one go. Some of us might do. We've got the time, but I'm. That's why we have chapters in a book. Um, we can. I, I spread it, it out over twelve months, Chris. Yeah. Well, exactly. I'm exactly the same. I mean, like you and I, Sam, we're currently playing Dead Space Three. The longest together. session. Uh, we've been playing it. What was it last? We, what was it last year? We we got in, we played a game last year in November, was it? And we figured out the last time that we played was in June or July. Yeah, but 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 to be honest, we we were both amazed because for us, time really hadn't it hadn't been that long since we'd last played, and and we just picked it up and we got on with it, and and that kind of bitty bitty kind of approach, although kind of disconcerting each time we replay is gone after the first minute or so once we've acclimatised to the controls. And actually, I look forward to it, and I enjoy having that project on the side that me and Sam can just meet up and chip away at. Um, we don't, I don't think we lose anything in comparison to if we just played it solidly over a weekend together. In fact, I think we get more out of it. I mean, I want to bring Pete into this, because Pete, as well as being a busy co-founder and podcaster, in retrospect, you are also a community manager and critic for a mobile gaming site and obviously the type of games that you review um, are often trying to uh, work themselves around your everyday working life they're trying to fit into those periods those small pauses those small gaps in your busy working life where you can chip away at them i wonder what you think of regards to how time is used by gamers yeah so um the the more general question is so there are definitely games whereby you it is a time sink, and those are often end up being, you know, yeah, these strategy management games. They're often, um, you know, free to play, that kind of thing. Like wait a certain amount of time and, and do whatever. But also, gameplay sessions can be extremely short, and, and you know, a matter of you know, thirty seconds, forty five seconds, or whatever. Um, they can be very, very, very fast. Um, I suppose the larger question is like, what do we mean by a valuing time like well the thing I, is it's just like I, you're no peter you're notoriously bad at, mm. at dropping a game an hour in yeah. because it hasn't grabbed your attention no. now when i'm saying about how much we value that's how much you value your time you're saying i value my time so much that no matter what the game if it hasn't got me within an hour 40 minutes done move on to the next o- onto the shelf yeah now, there's too many it's too many good games yeah but doesn't but does that mean but does that mean you're sort of overvaluing your time? You could miss something out at one minute past sixty mm. minutes that will change your life. So I so <laughs> it's really difficult to explain this one, but so I value my time immensely, my entertainment time. Because actually what what I'm trying to get get to the root of here is what is it that's valuable about the time that we spend playing video games? Like, a lot of people... So the, the, the classic argument is like, oh, you put 100 hours into World of Warcraft, oh, you know what you could have done in, with 100 hours? And the answer is yes, you know, like... Like, yes, you could you could put 100 hours into something, and uh, into a video game, and, and you've got nothing. You might have a little achievement at the end of it that says you platinumed it, you pl- platinumed it or something like that, but, you know, pretty much you're walking away with nothing. Or you could go and spend 100 hours reading a whole bunch of classic works of, you know, Sartre or whatever, you know, and and, and you would, in the eyes of society, be a a more well-read, more well-rounded individual. Or you could spend 100 hours with your friends or you could spend 100 hours uh, learning to cook. Um, But entertainment and relaxation time is extremely important and I value that immensely. So... When 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 somebody says, you know, oh, you sunk 10 hours into that over the weekend, I think, yeah, I did, because I relaxed for 10 hours over the weekend. Because at my other working time, you know, the time that is valuable to me, wherein I pay to keep a roof over my head, that's that's valuable in another sense. It's valuable in that I'll be doing my work then. But my, my free time is valuable in that I want to just chill out and do whatever. So it's not whether a case of games are worthy of your time it's a case of it's a case of whether or not the games are good enough to be worthy of your time like i i i put 
four hours into a single Age of Empires multiplayer match the other night, and I I learned so much about how games are multiplayer games are constructed. I and it, that that for me for my working life is actually invaluable. Like I can take that away and I can say, yeah, in Age of Empires, I know that it is a passive, pretty much a passive rush to to evolve essentially your 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 population such a point that you've got excellent um uh, excellent military and you can therefore take over everything um you know very very quickly like i i now understand how that works and that that's useful to me in my working life um equally like what is it that we're trying to get out of games is it is it a fantastic story because if so i would argue there are games that are worth your time is it uh, a fun experience to share with friends again i would say that as long as you're not playing truth or lies <laughs> that is that is absolutely the case, you know, um, or is it simply that 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 we want to to see something that's beautiful in movement, you know? And again, I would say that you know, games have you covered. So I think that it, it depends what you want out of games, and whether or not the games that you fill that free time with uh, are any good or not. So before we wrap up, I think we've had some time now to deliberate on what our New Year's resolutions are for 2014. I don't know how to end that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's your resolution. <laughs> to figure out how to end that sentence. Yeah. Have a think. Have a think upon it. Do you know, I've got uh, my... I've uh, got Pete, my... What's your New Year's resolution then? My New Year's resolution, as an aside... Dan, hello. What did you What did you say you could? What was your What was your achievement in getting fit? Um, well, the achievement would be just kind of an improvement on the level that I am able to do. And right, you, right. There's, there's certain stats that I can I can lift higher weights, or I can row right, or so, well, run for longer. Or something. okay, so you can run for longer. So what can you run, and what can you lift? Uh, I usually do. Oh, see, but I'm weak. This is an embarrassing. Yeah, but, yeah, but just, just, uh, just go for it, because, because I'm, 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 I'm terrible, and I'm not going to judge you. Do it, Dan, uh, Dan, I, do I, it. Do measure, measure the weight as something that sounds impressive. So not like a bag of sugar. Think of yeah. it like ten thousand Freddos, <laughs> <laughs> which I probably eat. Yeah, go on. Well, I can't so wear that out now. Like paper clips. Go on, go on, you um, can anyway, well, I, I, the weights that I do, um, I do chest press. And uh, converse press, uh, which is eighty-five kilo, and I usually do five sets of those. Eighty-five kilos. Uh, so you can lift ten reps. Is that good? And what yeah. can you run? And what can you run? Uh, running constantly for twenty minutes, and that's minutes. at there's there's kind of if you talking about treadmill, you're looking at speed. So that's usually point about eleven point five. So eleven point five. Yeah, twelve. So twelve. Let's go with twelve. Okay, so my news resolution is I'm going to um, run for 30 minutes at 12 miles an hour uh, by the end of the year. I'm going to get fit this year, and I'm going to try and beat you, Dan, uh, in your previous attempt at getting fit. Well, why, did, um, why didn't you try and beat my best time in the 5K? Because you're actually fit. Yeah, and, no, but, hey! Dan, but I'm not, yeah, not going to... I, I, the, the best thing you can do is to try and... If you want, if you really want to get fit, then a sub thirty minute five k is a is a good place to start. I'm not super interested in the whole running thing, but I will take it's, that on. You're not it's super sounds, interested in the whole like, running thing, and you want to run for what was your what was your what was your thing? Was it fair, thirty minutes at twelve miles an hour? You you got to get if you want to run you're, thirty you're minutes at, around this five k mark with that. So yeah, yeah. they're yeah. roughly about the same. Okay, so if you, okay, if so, you want to get into it, then yeah. you've got to. You've you've got to take it. You can't you can't just say you're not seriously into it and then go. You want to run thirty minutes so solid at twice. So five five k what? I, this almost sounds like uh, we're setting up for a race that we're all going to race each other. 
the uh, in retrospect, do the fastest 5k. 5K sure. Or we could actually make this kind of like uh, philanthrop philanthropic, and we all run together. We do a half marathon together. Oh, I Lord. cannot think of a funnier sight. <laughs> I like the idea of us all do trying to do the quickest quickest 5k we can. <laughs> I think that would be quite funny. Pete, it shouldn't be too difficult for you. This was this is the person who you know chased after a robber from Sainsbury's. Well, exactly, Sorry, chased yeah. after a robber from the supermarket you worked at. You've got history, Pete. Yeah. I'll be fine then. All right. Yeah. So you, you just got to do that. You just need, you just need you know, an objective to run for. You need a reason to run for. Okay. 5K, you, need like, then. you need like a carrot Easy. at the end of a piece of string. What's okay. your, what's your carrot gonna, be? I'm going to do... The, the, the carrot at the end of the stick is, 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 is um, showing up uh, my good friend Dan. Like... What basically at the end of the at the end of 2014, I want rock hard abs, and I want Dan to poke them, and go look at those rock hard abs, and I'll go and we'll yeah. go. Never mind the rock hard abs. Where's the sorbet? It's been yeah. three years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Okay, so Pete's New Year's resolution is we've got, actually got specific numbers here. I think thirty Pete, minutes. I think when Five. we go down. I think when we, you know, when we go to Dan's for the wedding, I think we could, we could, you know, get in some quick training sessions while we're there. I think, I think we'll need it um, when we're there. I think that'd be quite useful for you. So we'll have like a little halfway mark throughout the year, to kind of see how you're getting okay. on, yeah, and fine. just check in with you. Um, okay, so that's that's Pete Soid. Brilliant, Dan. Uh, well, I'm I'm now going to do two. Uh, one kind of is influence inspired by yours last year, Chris. And I'm going to join Pete, and I'm also going to try and do a 30-minute 5K because I'm not at that level yet, so I'm going to go with that. But my other news resolution is to get married. You, oh. you had the PhD last year. My news resolution this year is to get married. Yeah, but... Oh. but Fortunately, but I Chris could, have, Chris, could have still fa Chris could have still failed his. You can still go through it, even if you fall out of love, just to prove a point, can you? Yeah. Yeah, whereas Chris could have paid all the money like you've paid all the money for the wedding so you might as well go for it whereas chris paid all oh, the money well. for his phd but he still could have failed it and that was out of his control um i'm sticking with mine <laughs> okay so pete getting fit dan getting married sam wise what's yours my uh new year's resolution uh it was a, it's a resolution i actually made to do before i was 30 but i thought you know screw it i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it ahead um, and just do it now before the end of the year is to touch my toes. Good for you. So yeah. So at the moment, if I was to stand up, um, right, okay. If I stand up uh, and I bend down, my hands. I want a picture of this. Right. We can we could do this. So we could we could we could picture this throughout the year. My hands, the tips of my fingers are touching, yeah. just at the bottom of my kneecaps. Wow, these are all these are all very good, like very proactive. Very, it, it, it shows that we've hit we've hit middle age, really, doesn't it? So I'm getting married. Pete's getting fit. Sam's getting flexible. Chris, what are you getting? Um, I'm getting fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, two things for me actually. One is uh, a little editorial thing. Just from editing the shows, I realise that I do say that the words kind of quite a lot when I'm talking. Yeah, I kind of say that quite a lot. So I'm, I'm going to try and put a stop to that just because it annoys me when I'm editing myself. Um, secondly, I think I really do want to get fit. And uh, since living in Liverpool since September, it's been a bit cold out. I've not really found a good running route yet. I do body weather on a Friday night. but like, Do you do what? Body weather. Body weather? Yeah, it's 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 basically a form of um, contemporary dance where um, that it's it's like kind of like part circuit training. And I said kind of. Oh. <laughs> it's part circuit training, part dance, part physical theatre. That sounds cool. Like two hours on a Friday night. Yeah, it's it's really good. It's really knackering. But I want to kind of do some get back into my long distance running, um, really. And I, I possibly I'd like to take up yoga as well. I've always wanted to do yoga. I could never afford it, but now I can. So. Might, there's a yeah, good yoga place not far from me, so I'll probably take up yoga. Oh, we get all getting nice no, no, and fit. And just, and, just to, and just to give you an idea, uh, Pete, about how stupid your original um, uh, <laughs> your original resolution was. What do you say you want? You want to run for thirty minutes at twelve miles an hour. Yeah. When I did 
my <laughs> sub 30 minute um, 5k, my average running speed was 6.4 miles per hour. <laughs> okay. So, so I think running, I think. Into a leopard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I think, I think, um, I think you serious, I, I think we've kind of saved you in a, in a way. Thanks. Thanks. We, we, <laughs> we've definitely um, parsed down your expectations. I think, yeah, you, you, we, we stopped you from, you know, being able to time travel, basically. Right, Dan. Right. What, what was it? Sorry, I've finally worked this out. Do you say you lift 86 kilograms? Kilos? Uh, 85. 85. 860 dairy milks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that concludes another episode of Free Play. Join us next month when we're back to the old format, discussing the best games you can play for free. If you can't wait till then, join me again next week for the latest episode of Digital Wonderlust. All our past shows are available from the site in retrospectpodcast.com, as well as our Twitter and Facebook links. We're also available on Stitcher Radio. And the best thing you can do, listen, the best thing you can do is to head over to iTunes and leave us a cheeky five-star review. Set us up nicely for 2014. Feel free to leave us a comment as well on our site. Maybe you've seen something in Truth or Lies that we missed. So till next month, Happy New Year, and thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>